For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Jason Andre. He's the chief marketing officer of one of the fastest growing companies in the country, New Fabrics. Jason has over 15 years of success within the healthcare industry, and he joined New Fabrics from GlaxoSmithKline, where he led their global digital marketing department, executing marketing strategies across global categories. On the show today, we talk a little bit about his new product, New Fabrics, and the company itself, what they're doing, how they're building a new category of putting medicine in clothing, and the product that they have out in the market today, which is for pain relief through compression sleeves. We talk about biohacking, how to build and think about a new product, new brand, new category, co opetition with other folks through their B2B offering that they have, licensing the technology that they developed and innovated around, and much more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jason Andre. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. Well, it's not every day you get to uh, talk to a real life cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you've got, you've made a living in some form or fashion from <laughs> showing cattle and you actually own two working farms. Yeah. I have to know more about this. <laughs> it's funny to start off this way, but you know, as, <laughs> as I've um, traveled around a bit and kind of told my story, I find how interesting it is to other people. It's <laughs> Obviously not that interesting to me, but yeah. So I grew up showing steers around the U.S. We raised them and then showed them throughout, I guess, the, the cattle circuit. <laughs> but I, that put me in, I, you know, I grew up in 4-H and FFA, and then I started showing cattle and a little bit of pigs on the side. But yeah, we showed crossbreds as a kid and really into my early 20s. And it's how I bought my first car. It's how I started to pay my way through college. <laughs> but <it was> kind of, <laughs> I grew up on a farm, obviously, to allow me to do that. I wasn't an inner city kid <laughs> showing cattle. But yeah, I did that with my siblings. And now I've grown to, to own those farms with my siblings. And so we don't have livestock anymore, but we do grow wheat, soybean, and corn. And you know we sell that during the season for harvest. So yeah, I guess in a literal sense, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I love it. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to transition to marketing, but we'll get there. <laughs> so it can be. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess technically it's you were you were responsible for the product, the yeah. marketing and the sales. Well, 100 percent. And showing a cow is all about presentation and yeah. you have the competition in the ring. Uh, you have to groom the steer to show best in class. It requires everything from bathing it to feeding it to actually <laughs> spray painting it. <laughs> oh you know, we, so, we sometimes have to, I have to yeah, ask because yeah. pigs pigs were involved. You did not put lipstick on a pig, did you? No, like that, you that, do not okay. put lipstick on a pig, but you right. do sometimes put nail polish on a hoof. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my lord! Well, I've always wondered if that lipstick, putting lipstick on a pig, saying came from something that was real. So I, I think I can scratch that off my list. <laughs> not, not anything I was involved in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, from cowboy life to marketing, <laughs> what was your path, if you will, to becoming the chief marketing officer at New Fabrics? <laughs> so right after showing a cow, no. <laughs> um, I really kind of got into marketing through sales, to be honest with you. I was always interested in marketing, but was a firm believer I should start a career in sales. And that's how I did it. And then I kind of worked my way around a large matrix organization. You know, it was GlaxoSmithKline. I mm -hmm. had 15 years there and absolutely loved it. But started in sales. I did a stint in innovation, then really got into brand marketing. But for me, what was interesting, there was a common thread of launching new products. I was able to always be on a product that wasn't in market. And then we brought it to market through all of my roles. And then that's where my passion for marketing really grew. I don't see marketing as just ads. I, I do see marketing as a strategic engine for an entire brand and an entire business. And so as that grew and I moved up what I think a lot of people know as the traditional marketing ladder, I ended up in a really nice space where 
I became an expert, not just in marketing, but it was more digital marketing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because I had the pleasure of working on brands before they hit the market. So I also had the liberty of working with a budget that was a little bit fictitious in the fact that I could put a higher weight towards digital. And so, yeah, and then I ended up at GSK living in Switzerland and I was running their digital content team. I absolutely loved that. And I think then my passion for marketing grew into a passion for leadership because I was able to manage a large team there. Mm. And I really just felt then was the time. And I really wanted to find a brand that I personally believed in. That's when I came across New Fabrics. And when I fell in love with that and really aligned myself to their mission, it made sense. And so that's when I made the jump from big pharma company to small healthcare startup. I love it. Well, I, and tell us a little bit about New Fabrics. What, what does the company do? How, you know, where, how was it formed? That kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm very proud to work with New Fabrics and our products. And simply put, we put medicine in, in clothing. And so that sounds <laughs> weird to some, <laughs> but the company's really developed a really unique platform where we're able to take any active ingredient a vitamin or supplement, and we break that down into a water-soluble state, and we're able to impregnate yarn with it. And so from that yarn, we're able to make garments, and we can make anything, as you can imagine, from a, from a yarn. So we can make t-shirts, shorts, et cetera. But what we sell at retail, which, which is what I love, is for the pain category. And we sell a compression sleeve that already has in it uh, pain-relieving medicine. So not only do you just put on a uh, support for your pain, it's actually transdermally delivering medicine right to the source of your pain. And so I found that incredibly fascinating from a product and a huge opportunity to help the pain category. But then, as you can imagine, the possibilities are infinite in the fact that we can put any active ingredient in, in any product. So we're working on doing that now through our platform, which is really exciting for me, not just from marketing, but from an innovation standpoint. Yeah, no, I mean, it's fascinating if you think about it. And and the company is based, if I'm not mistaken, in North Carolina. That's um, right. That's <laughs> that's the state I grew up in. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so near and dear to my heart. But it's also the textiles like mm-hmm. Mecca, if you will. I, I'm having, it must be related if, right. if, in some respect. No, yeah, you, you're 100% right. So our founder founded the company in Seattle, but quickly realized that the technology really was based in, as you mentioned, textiles. Mm. And so he moved the company to North Carolina to work with experts in that industry. I think he was disrupting the textile industry 100% by putting medicine in it. And at the time, he needed people to help understand how to do that from a mill perspective. Mm-hmm. So relocated here, we're 100% based and we source all of our product materials from with 90 miles from our manufacturing plant here in North Carolina. And I'm proud to say that we work with what I think some of the leading innovators within the textile industry. So yeah, that's what brought us to North Carolina. And I'm recently calling it home because I just moved here. Ah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did growing <laughs> up there. Um, it's beautiful. I, it's, it's actually beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's the best state in the 50 states, in my opinion, but I'm biased. <laughs> I'm <laughs> but, starting uh, to agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing that's interesting about that state and, and the fact that your co- the company is located there is you've got pretty big research centers. I mean, you've got mm-hmm. in the research triangle area, you've got most of the major pharmaceutical companies have some sort of headquarters, including GlaxoSmithKline, yeah. where you came from. Yeah. So I'm familiar with Triangle Circle and, and I've been there since under a new badge name. And so Triangle Circle is something I'm familiar with. But what's interesting too, to your point on science, we actually partner with, we have labs at UNCC. Mm. And so we do development there with the students. And it's something that I actually was doing yesterday, uh, which is pretty cool to watch. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I mean, uh, putting medicine in fabrics or clothing and mm-hmm. uh, and yarn, it sounds a little like biohacking, and <laughs> and and that it seems to be a trend that's growing. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I the first podcast I started listening to myself was Tim Ferriss show, uh-huh. and Tim is crazy because he <laughs> he he does all kinds of experiments on himself, right, mm-hmm. to try to figure out how to create even more wellness than you can imagine. And so I'm curious, are you seeing this too, like a a move towards mainstream biohacking, if you will? A hundred percent. And I think it's, it's definitely a trend that's coming up that we're seeing from the consumers. And I, and it's, for me, it's really based in personalization. Everyone believes as they should, that they're unique and what's going to ail them is, is different. 
And so we're seeing consumers come up with personalized regimens. What they use and put on their face in the morning is different than what they use and put on their face at night. And everyone's trying to have a more of a holistic approach. And, and I think that doesn't mean they're not using medicines and things like that. They're really lugging them together in a personal way. And if you think about our product, it, it fits really great into that. And compression sleeves, for example, 10 years ago, probably wasn't something you'd see at the gym. And now I feel it's even trending from a fashion statement. <laughs> I think you see a lot of people wearing compression pants who probably aren't needing the support, but you're just seeing that as, as something regular that people are using to treat their pain. And then topicals, right? Topical pain relief is something new here in the US in the past decade or so. And we really, we're really bringing those two together. So we understood that consumers were kind of treating their pain with multiple products. And, and we really did bring two together. And it's really interesting too, because I would say it's how our founder and CEO developed the product. Because when he was in college, his dermatologist, he suffered from bad acne like several of us. And his dermatologist told him that he needed to wash his bed sheets more often, that that was one of the sources of his, mm -hmm. of his acne. And he, he will say it time and time <laughs> again, wasn't going to happen. He's like, I'm not interested in washing my sheets that often, I think as anybody in college would probably agree to. So yeah. he started putting his medicine in his sheets. Oh, wow. Kind of, okay. <laughs> and then hence was the birth of this product. And it's since grown over the years from that. But he was probably biohacking before all of us. <laughs> mm. That's funny. That's really funny. Well, I mean, I, I actually had somebody on recently, um, David Fossis from uh, Restore Hyper Wellness. I feel like I need to make an introduction to you guys. because he, He's there in that biohacking space as well. I, I don't know if you would call it that, but opening retail locations for various kinds of treatment opportunities and things mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, it's definitely, I, I think, something that's catching on. And uh, you talk about compression wear so to speak uh, i go to the gym and there's this one woman in there that i think is completely coated in neoprene mm -hmm. um <laughs> but and as i get older i'm th starting to really become attracted to things that can help with pain yes. <laughs> so, <Or preventive. laughs> yes exactly i may be i may be a a new customer very soon um, oh, love that. <laughs> so, but um well how do i how do you think about and begin to build a new brand and a, and a product into a leader in a relatively new category, it seems mm -hmm. as well? You no, know, it's, it's really interesting, I think, too, from the category perspective, because we're really trying to build a new category within the space of healthware. It's not mm -hmm. something people are familiar with. It's definitely a new way of delivering medicine. And mm -hmm. so it isn't easy, but I think for me, it's all about identifying the white space, which isn't a, an original idea. That's something that we all talk about, but I think it's not forgetting that. Everybody suffers from pain, talking about our category specifically, uh, but it's unique and personal for everybody. The way that you feel pain is going to be different than the way that I feel pain. And really identifying what's missing in that pain journey and capitalizing on it. And so we believe that we are delivering something new to the consumer that is a better experience. So not only do we need to bring that brand to the forefront, we actually have to develop that category. And we talk a lot about healthware and the benefits of treating directly at the source, mm. uh, something you can wear all day for pain relief, which is what everyone's searching for, but not finding and really staying true and working within that white space and not worrying so much, I guess, about your competition and what they're doing, because I think a lot of things we talk about at New Fabrics is there isn't any competition. Right. There's nobody in healthware. So, so why right. would we follow what pills and creams are doing? So we kind of just carve our own way. And, and again, it, it, for me, it's operating in that white space. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like some of the benefits you're just outlining, the combination. I mean, it makes sense, right? You're combining a treatment like a what might be a, a cream or a mm -hmm. some sort of topical treatment with actual apparel. Mm -hmm of some sort and, and making that those benefits come together, if you will. So treating at the source and wearing it all day, it makes logical sense. Uh, yeah. But it also, to your point in the white space, it's not something I've seen before. And so it does take a little bit of education. I would guess. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's all about the creative and the messaging because we find with our story, the reaction we get is if we're able to tell it in an appropriate way, everyone's like, wow, what an amazing product sounds amazing. I'd love to try that. But to your point, it's, how do you get that message in front of people? And as we all know, in a yeah. very short amount of time. 
and it is a complex story. So I think creative and messaging really, really matters for us. And it's how do you articulate a difficult message and to me, a real scientific message in a, in a very short amount of time. And so, so I feel like we're doing that. And we've actually seen a lot of repeat purchasers because of that, which is amazing. So we know the product work. And so that's kind of, that's just been our target from, from a healthware perspective. Love it. Well, how do you, how are you thinking about kind of building marketing, if you will, that helps you stand out from your competition? Yeah. Honestly, and it's going to go, it's kind of going to go back to basic. It's, it's strong creative. I think we, mm. I think a lot of marketers forget about that and don't misread that. And like, I, I'm a firm believer <laughs> in marketing, honestly. Like, I, I do think we have to go after the right person at the right time. But I think it's the delivering that right message that a lot of time falls flat. I mean, Everybody, like we said, suffers from pain. So therefore, they're familiar with this category. They're familiar with what works and what doesn't work for them. So we have to get in front of them with something that's going to make them rethink their message or their, their selection, I mean. And, right. and it's, just, it's just interesting because since this category, people are constantly searching for, for something new. We don't have to take that much time to offer them the new solution. Mm. And so we're really able to just kind of play with our creative in a really unique way. And I also think what's special about it is people who are the most familiar with pain, to be honest, are going to tend to be a little bit older. And I think sometimes that demographic gets forgot about and everyone wants to kind of message in a fun and a cool way to a younger target. And I think we're trying and creating fun and unique ways to message to an older demographic, which, which to be honest with you, I love because it's not something I've really done before. Um, I don't think it's a lot of, it's not something a lot of people are doing. And when done right, I think you're going to gain a lot of loyalist consumers. Yeah, no, I, it's fascinating that you bring that up because a friend of mine who's been on the show before, he's kind of a a marketing commentator, if you will, Bob Hoffman. He's also an old curmudgeon, (laughs) so, but he, he talks about the, the fact that like everyone, everyone in marketing is focused on the young consumer, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're like Mm -hmm. the next generation. And he's like, but if you think about it in terms of like disposable income, yeah. they have the least amount of disposable income. <laughs> yeah. And cars, luxury items, all are mostly purchased by older people in mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. the grand scheme of things. And uh, it is an untapped market. Like we yeah. don't, as an industry, don't typically focus on them. And uh, so, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's funny too, like older people don't feel old. And, and so no. I a lot of times <laughs> yeah. brands are just like, okay, we need to, to, for this demographic, just switch out the talent for someone 50 plus. Right. And, and that's just not correct. And I think you really need to talk to them as people, because to be honest, to your point, not only are they valuable, but they're people who don't resonate with someone who has gray hair and running through a field. <laughs> like, right. They, they want to be spoke to in a way that doesn't make them feel isolated or not like who they are. Right. I mean, that you can tell that like it cracks me up. Uh, occasionally I'll catch the AARP mm-hmm. magazine front mm-hmm. cover. Right. And it's always somebody like George mm-hmm. Clooney or mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. right at the cusp of actually qualifying for AARP. Yeah. Because no one, no one wants to see themselves as that gray haired old person. <laughs> uh, we don't think about like even yeah, the people right. that have gray hair and are older, they don't think they see themselves as their 30 or 40 year old selves. You know? No, I completely agree. And with ARP, we love ARP. We were actually (laughs) featured. They wrote an article about us in December and it did really well for us. And I completely agree with you that people don't, I think also two people judge ARP. They think it's like a bunch of really old people. Like, no, no, this is, (laughs) there's a lot of us at New Fabrics who subscribe to ARP. (laughs) Right, right. I don't think I'm too far off the demographic. Like, I think I've I've got a few more years, but um, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty low threshold, like 50 or 55, something like that. (laughs) But yeah, and I don't see 50 as old people. No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's the uh, message you should take away <laughs> yes yes so uh well it's awesome i mean it's great it sounds like a fantastic product and um and pretty interesting like the target that you're focused on yeah. today and the white space that you found i mean you are a newer brand and you've got like yeah. you you've got i would imagine definitely smaller budgets than a gsk yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like how how do you think about the jujitsu that you have to do to make that budget for that 
you know, smaller amount of resources work harder for you? So it's a really great question. It's probably a question we have to answer every day. And I mean, the obvious answer is you have to be flexible. But to be honest, it's like flexing on a daily basis. And it's ensuring that every dollar doesn't go to waste. And, and any marketer obviously would would agree to that. But I think for us, it's it's very it's very different in the sense that we have to pivot not only with the consumer but with the platform. But there's going to be some months where we feel that social media is actually really driving a lot of conversion for us. But then we'll quickly realize that advertisements on Walmart.com or Amazon then are converting at a higher rate, and we start to budget immediately because I can't afford to have dollars that aren't just driving. Right. And then the the other side of that is, which I think is the harder question to answer is like, how do you get broad awareness? We were talking about the category creation and a new product. And how do you message that? Like that does require broad awareness. And honestly, we do that through laser targeting and making sure that we're only hitting the demographic that we we're setting out for. You do that through direct to TV. YouTube is actually a, a great channel and converts for us really well. And so it's just being close with the consumer and where they're going. But then also there's this side where I have a great relationship with our chief revenue officer. And it's making sure that retail is also getting the attention it needs yeah. and making sure that we're advertising on those platforms and channels. So it's really just being flexible. I also think it's just working within your parameters mm. and taking calculated risks. A lot of things when we talk about is, do we believe that this is going to, this spend is going to return? And there's a lot of things we want to do that are big and audacious that we're like, you know what? We don't know because we've never done it before, but we believe that it will. And sometimes it pays off and sometimes mm. it doesn't. I think a lot of people think with smaller budgets, you're not able to take risks, but we definitely do. I think we're playing on the fringes of that for sure, because we have to invest our money where we know is working. But at the same time, we don't want to, we don't want to miss an opportunity or a leap step opportunity really is so like, so if we believe it's going to touch the masses, it is something that we go after. That's awesome. Well, I know that you've, you're both kind of a consumer brand, if you will, in various retail as mm -hmm. well, but you also, the company offers licensing of the underlying innovation that you've developed. And so you're in the B2B market as well. Yeah. What, what does that side of the business look like? It's a great question. And it's actually something that I get to spend a lot of time in. And it's very exciting to me. And it kind of goes back to my roots with innovation. But um, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, we own the technology that not only allows you to infuse medicine or active ingredients into yarn, but it actually coats it as well. So our products, you can wash and the medicine doesn't run out. The technology allows for a, a skin activated time release technology, which, which, is, which is extremely beneficial. And like you had mentioned, we at retail have a pain compression sleeve that we sell, but we also license that technologies to other companies who want to do similar things, whether it's in bedding is a good example, apparel. There's a lot of performance apparel brands out there who claim to be able to improve your performance. What if they were able to enhance that performance by delivering some sort of a vitamin or, or mm -hmm. active ingredient through their clothing? So, so as you can imagine, I can't mention any, anybody. Right, but, right. You know, apparel companies don't put medicine in clothing. And let's be honest, pharmaceutical companies don't make clothing. And so with the creation of healthware, we're sitting at the intersection where we can do that for either party. And so what's exciting to me about that is I get to work with some large brands even though I'm a small, small brand. And, and I think for me that that is very exciting because I get to see and work still with both sides of the branding world, which, which is really exciting. And let's be honest, like I think sometimes too, people would say that that's crazy. This is your competition. And we, we really don't think that way. We, we invite that in and figure out like innovation can only come from the consumer behavior. And so if that's true, going even back to biohacking, we have to work with individuals who, who, consumers view as solutions as well. Right. I always thought about that as like co <laughs> Um because because you're you're building an entirely new category. It actually is helpful to have other people in the category helping build it as well. That's right. That's right. And 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 we know brands that do that, right? Like mm -hmm. the Intel inside type of thing. Right. Yep. And, and so if if a larger brand is wants to and is going to carry our technology I think that's an amazing opportunity 
to get in front of consumers and help educate them that this is a way to to receive medicine or, or vitamins. And, and so, yeah, we get to work with a lot of brands and then true innovation comes from those discussions. Things that we would never create on our own, we're able to, we're able to create with others, which, which is fascinating. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's a fascinating business. I think something that hopefully listeners will check out because it, it's, uh, it's truly white space. And, uh, but one of the things we love to do on the show is get to know you a little bit more. Um, we know uh, apparently lipstick doesn't go on a pig, but uh, <laughs> you lived that cowboy life. I'm curious <laughs> if there's been an, other experiences uh, of your past that define or make up who you are today. Yeah. Uh, so not to take like a, a tone turn for the worst, but no. Okay. so I, I lost both of my parents at a very young age and very close together. Mm-hmm. And that unfortunately was an event that really changed my path, but it taught me a lot about what I'll call is how to handle my ambition. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think, and it made me realize that you can turn, you have to turn really negative situations into positive ones. And what that taught me about ambition is, it's like, you don't want to lose your ambition, but I think you need to make sure that your ambition is something that positively feeds you versus negatively. I've met so many successful and ambitious people who are just worn out. Their ambition stresses them out. And I'm a firm believer that your ambition should be something that makes you grow. And it may, you know, and it's something that feeds your, your drive, doesn't deplete it. Mm. And so, yeah, that, that unfortunately is something that is really an event that made, made me change my direction, but it also, I think has made me the leader I am and how I work with people and really kind of how I look at, you know, the future. That's awesome. Well, I, yeah, it's, it's great to, to be able to turn something like that into a positive experience. It's, it's motivating as well. Right. So, well, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this journey all over again? Mm. <laughs> so many things. <laughs> I think, I think I, what it would be for me is plan out your career because mm. no one's going to do it for you. But don't think about it as what I'm going to do next. Think about it as what you're going to do in the next three or four moves and let the next move leave room for, for where you want to go. And also to take opportunities that might surprise you because my career, have I ended up where I wanted to? I'd like to think so. How I got here, could I have imagined it? No. <laughs> so <laughs> I would say plan it out, but don't plan it out to a point where it doesn't allow you to take new roads. Yeah. It's interesting you say it. Like, I've never heard somebody put it quite like that. Like I've heard like the jungle gym approach versus mm-hmm. the ladder approach. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. But I think you're right. Like it's not making the the next step so crystal clear that yeah. you're you lose track of where trying yeah. to get to. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree because I think so many people are just focused on their next step. Yeah. And therefore they lose sight of the bigger picture. Right. And, and so, yeah, it's just keep your eye on the future and then how you're going to get there. Let that grow. Let that be mm-hmm. flexible, but don't change your goalposts. Right. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, is there a topic you think marketers need to be learning more about or maybe something you're trying to learn more about yourself? I th- for, it's kind of like that creative point we were talking about. I mm-hmm. think I think for me, marketers are always worried and they should be about how to leverage the data we have access to and making sure that everything is performing correctly, which, which is something you cannot lose sight of. You need that. But for me, the, the foundation is creative and learning what stories resonate and what trends are popular and following those. And so, so for me, I'm always constantly looking to read less about marketing and performance. And I'm looking more for what creative is moving the needle. How, how do you tell better stories? And so that's something I would tell marketers, like, please don't lose sight of it. Because to be honest with you, it's probably the reason you got into marketing. Right. You probably fell in love with that, that creative side and, and your passion was art and things like that. And I was like, please revisit that. Please, please <laughs> continue to grow in that area. Yeah. Well, and I think most people forget that I can't remember the actual stats. I'm going to I'm going to be a little liberal here, but I, I want to say something that it's greater than 50% mm-hmm. of effectiveness is driven by how you execute the message, right? Like the creative aspect of it, 100%. not where you place it or the money you're spending behind it. And, and we do become a little too obsessed with those things and yeah. forget that there's a bigger dial on the other side. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So no, I agree. And you have to, yeah, and you have to grow that muscle, or you have to continuously right. grow that muscle. Is what I mean. Right. Yeah. I agree. Agree. Well, on a personal level, are there any brands or companies or causes that you follow, or you think other people should be taking notice of? So I don't know how familiar it would be with this, and maybe I'll regret it. But something I've been reading a lot about. Have you heard about the microbiome and that its effect to your health? Uh, I, I, I've heard a little bit about it, but I, I, I need to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this idea and you're starting to see brands put label or put on their labels like that it's microbiome gentle or microbiome safe. And so there's a lot of studies currently taking place. They, they haven't published yet, but this idea that your microbiome sits on top of your skin and it's actually part mm. of your, what drives your health. And, and I've listened and talked to some scientists who believe that through products, we've actually damaged our microbiome and it's what's causing inflammation and certain diseases within the population. And so I've, you know, why, I don't know, I've kind of become obsessed with it, but I do think it's something that's going to hit the market and consumers are going to pay a lot of attention to. And I think consumers are going to shift to how does this product affect my health? Yeah. Does this damage my microbiome? And so it's something that for me is like a cause I've really been researching. One. Yeah. From a personal level, I'm very curious about it. But two, I'm looking for how that's going to change regulations and how that's going to change consumers' minds about how they select products. So it's something that if you haven't heard about, I would definitely look into it. It could turn out to be nothing. But for me, I think there's a lot of traction there. Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds interesting. I mean, there are, we don't think about it because you can't see it, right? But there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of things happening on the skin of our bodies yeah. <laughs> and we think it's just skin but no it's like a living living, it's organism. A living organism yeah totally yeah. And, and then even to the the trend on biohacking people are starting to notice that certain products do or don't work for them mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that they do or don't work for other people's and i think people are starting to notice that why and what's driving that i think we don't know but maybe the answer is here yeah Interesting. I have to, I have to learn more myself. So thank you for. Well, you won't find a lot. I think it's a newer thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'll, I'll check into it for sure. Well, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or biggest threat facing marketers today? I th well, it's an opportunity and a threat is I think the speed of the consumer. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, it's changing so fast. I think for me personally, and potentially for a lot of other people is you spent, you, you used to spend all this time building a perfect strategy and a, perf a perfect narrative. And quite honestly, by the time you actually delivered it, the consumer was changed their opinion and their trade. Right. And so I think we really have to respect that. And so I think, yeah, the rate in which the consumer changes can be an amazing, powerful resource for you if you play into it. But if not, it can be a huge weakness. Fascinating. Well, Jason, thank you so much for enlightening us on this new white space, <laughs> how you're growing a category and a brand. Um, it's been a great conversation. All right. I really enjoyed the time, Alan. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today. And you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.